Obviously, I'm a voting nerd, that kind of happens. Um, the way that I got into voting is kind of interesting because I was asking myself, of like, if I'm going to give to charity, if I'm going to work towards the betterment of my community, what's the best and most effective way to do it? I got involved in the effective altruism community, and one of the things that I kept on asking myself was, why are the laws that we have so flawed? Why are the policies that we have not representative of the ways that we think not representative of the community. I'm also ready to help. You can ask me about that. So 17% of Americans feel that Congress isn't doing their job properly. That, sorry, 70% think that Congress is doing their job properly, which means that our Congress has a massive disagreement. We don't think that anything is getting done. I think this is obvious. This is why basically everyone is here. 91% think that our current politics is divided, which means that if you meet someone who's Republican or Democrat and you're on the other side, you judge them. You find it impossible to get any common ground. You have a conversation in a taxi. You think, oh, God, I should get out of this taxi in the next life. Which happened to be on my way over here. Um, and it's strange. It doesn't make sense because the moment we start using these labels, you realize that you can have no common ground. But if you talk to people without the labels of Democrat or Republican, people can have some really interesting and nuanced views on uh, very normally divisive pieces of politics, healthcare legislation, everything. And 61% of people don't feel like they are represented by Democrats or Republicans which means that while we use these labels to identify other people, when we think about ourselves, we think like, well, I'm not really a Democrat, I'm not really a Republican, I'm kind of a moderate, but you know, I do the best that I can with the representatives that I have, with the system that's available. So, let's take a step back, and I want to ask you a bit of a silly question, we're going to do a game. What's your favorite ice cream? Now, this has to be your absolute favorite, you only get to choose one. We're going to go through it and raise your hand if this particular ice cream is your favorite. Strawberry. Nobody. Okay. Mint chocolate chip. Okay. Cookies and cream. Okay. Vanilla. Okay. Uh, Cherry Garcia. You skipped chocolate. Oh, I skipped chocolate. Okay, chocolate. All right, good. Rocky Road. Okay. No one voted twice. I'm divided between chocolate and vanilla. Well, that's good. I like that. Um, so I'm going to put your vote then in the vanilla camp. So what happened, what, what happened here is there was a very strong divide between vanilla and chocolate, right? Everyone who didn't, who doesn't like vanilla or chocolate, your votes don't matter. Everything that you just told me completely ignored whether you like strawberry, mint chocolate chip, cookies, and cream. Sorry, you're going to eat the chocolate or vanilla. That's just how we're playing the game. Yes, I do have all the ice cream right here, but you can't have it. That's what a current voting system is like. When you get all of these candidates on this ballot, you only have one choice, despite the fact that maybe you like chocolate, but maybe you like vanilla. What if you could have two scoops? That would be even better, right? This is called first past the post, or plurality voting. And even worse is, let's say you do um, you have a real preference, but you know that the chocolate's going to win, you hate chocolate. So you think, okay, well, I really want mint chocolate chip. Oh, no, let's pick something else. Um, let's say you like... Um, uh, strawberry. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Let's say you like strawberry, but you know that only vanilla's going to win, right? So you don't actually get to vote for your preferred favorite. You have to go ahead and pick something else. Or, if everyone does vote honestly, you end up splitting the vote, which means that while people could generally agree that, yes, okay, let's get vanilla, because they split their votes between all the other candidates that they like, 
they don't end up getting the representative that they want to go for something that everyone thinks is actually a bit weird, but happens to have a very core body of support. We may have been seeing this in some recent elections where one candidate has a really strong group of support, and everyone else is a nice, normal moderate, but no one can really make up their minds because they all kind of look the same. Those votes get split, the more out of the box candidate wins, and is then purported to be representative of the entire community. So, you're forced to behave strategically. If you want to make sure that your vote doesn't get wasted, and if we did that election again with the ice cream one more time, the likelihood that you would vote for Strawberry or Rocky Road would be diminished. You think, well, I'm not really gonna support that. I wanna get the thing that I feel okay with as opposed to having my vote not count to the process whatsoever. So you choose for the lesser evil. When people end up behaving strategically, all of the incentives in the election change. It means that when you, it means that you want to clear the field as much as possible and make sure you only have two choices from your candidates. Let's look at what would happen if the Democratic election were held today. If you could choose only one, this is from a poll conducted September uh, 17th. Um, 1,500 average US citizens said that 25% would vote for Joe Biden, 19% for Elizabeth Warren, et cetera, go down. Very interestingly, 8% of people were not sure who they would vote for if, if they were voting in the Democratic primary. That's really high. You know, if you had only one choice, you think, okay, you know, 10% of people are just like, I, I don't even know, so much so that I won't participate. But then, now, if, if you're one of these candidates and you're doing poorly, let's say you're Kamala Harris, you need to get, get more vote share. But if you notice, all of this adds up to 100%. So if you want to get votes, you need to take them. In order to take them, you're going to run attack ads. Because you need to say, they're bad, I'm good. And that's the only way that you can get votes because all of those votes are spoken for already. So I ask you if you, were, if you were a candidate, would you run attack ads? Would you try to make sure that politics was as divisive as possible so that people could either choose me or that or him, or you're either with us or you're against us? That's what happens when you only get to choose one. That's also why politics is the way that it is today. It explains everything. It all derives from the way that we vote and is merely a natural continuation to being forced into the strategic process. And so with that, the moderates fall out the middle. Because as you as as candidates seek to define themselves, they'll go far to the left in their primaries. And then they'll try to edge closer, but ultimately they know that people in the middle are going to have kind of a split decision. They're not really going to want to participate. People don't feel that they're the representative that's there for them, and they drop out. So let's do this again. Let me ask you a different question. What ice creams do you like? Do you like Rocky Road? Raise your hand. Cool. Do you like strawberry? Uh, do you like mint chocolate chip? Do you like cookies and cream? I've never tried them. Wow, that's really impressive. Uh, do you like chocolate? Oh yeah, okay. Do you like vanilla? Great. And do you like Cherry Garcia? Now I hope you were looking around as people were voting because you shouldn't trust me for what I saw. And again, this really wasn't a very representative vote. But the interesting thing is, look at how much more participation we had. Right? We know now that if I'm going to get ice cream, I can get all of these different flavors, or I can choose one that will make the most people happy. Which means that if I'm a candidate and I have a policy, I might say that, like, you know what, I really, I'm strawberry and I don't really have that much support because I'm not going to be everyone's favorite. But if I look at this, I would, I would bring strawberry to a party, and I think the majority of you would be happy with me doing that interesting what happens when we change the question. We call this approval voting. It measures 
do you approve of this candidate or not? Do you approve of this measure or not? On a ballot, it's really simple because you just say, this candidate, I would be fine if they were president, or this candidate, nah, no thanks, I'll skip them. You can vote for as many as you like, you're not limited. You could vote for all of them, although it wouldn't really mean anything. You could also vote for none of them, you know, as a protest vote. But it would be recorded. It would be interesting. The great thing about this is it works with existing voting machines as well. There's no difficulty to implementation. All you have to do is configure the election separately, but a little bit differently. But effectively, it doesn't cost anything to implement, which gets over a lot of the major hurdles that you see with other voting systems and implementations. So, bringing us back to the ice cream metaphor, it allows you to more fully express your opinions because you get to say, this is how I feel. It acts more like a survey as opposed to an arbitrary it also means that you can always support the candidate that you really like, as opposed to having to vote for the lesser evil and be strategic about it. The nice thing is also the long running, the, the long run events of what happens is that when when you're able to have the polls represent the, the, the policies represent the polls, it means that more candidates end up running, which means that there are more voices in politics that the policies end up becoming more nuanced and higher quality. And when that happens, ultimately we you know, have better policy, we lead better lives. So fewer, oh, and the best thing is, because approval voting, when you, there's no benefit to saying, oh, they're terrible, because all you're gonna do is alienate people who support them. You remember what happened when Hillary Clinton said there are a bunch of deplorables, right? It turned out their base. So have an election method that means you're not trying to steal the vote share. Instead, talk about why you're great. So what would happen if we did polls for approval voting? The nice thing is we already do. The question that's asked here is, what candidates would you consider voting for? Which works out to be exactly the same way that approval voting works. And look here, more than anything, you can see that people are winning with 53, 51, 42% of the vote. And this is across a random sample, right? So that 53% of the vote would, would vote for that president. And that probably includes a decent set of Republicans. Also, notice that Elizabeth Warren's on top now with Joe, uh, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders. But look at how all these other, car uh, like uh, Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, all of them have <coughs> real bodies of support. And it's especially concerning when the fact that the way that we do polling right now also determines who has access to debates. It means that you really want a voting system that you know, evaluates how much support they have in general in the population as opposed to any kind of strategic behavior. You had a question? No? Okay. Don't worry about it. So this all sounds nice, um, but no point in me talking to you if this is going to be a pipe dream. Luckily, Fargo has led the way. So Fargo, yes, that Fargo, the one with the wood chipper, if you've ever seen the movie, <laughs> the Fargo. They made progress towards using approval voting. They, uh, they had unrepresentative elections. Um, the winner previously garnered less than 25% of the vote for their city council. So these were the results. Tony Garrick won with 22%, which meant that 78% of voters voted against him. So they were obviously very disappointed when that candidate ended up representing them in office. So the city of Fargo created an election task force in order to be able to figure out how do we make sure that we have an election that actually works as opposed to what happened. Funny enough, I actually had uh, Tom Garrick, that, that commissioner, on it. He wasn't very happy about it. <laughs> Um, this is Jed. Jed was on that commission, and he reached out to the Center for Election Science asking, how do we make our elections representative in the city of Fargo? We presented approval of voting. The task force ended up agreeing and then ultimately recommending to the city council to use and switch to approval voting. And the commission, unfortunately, refused to act. They refused to pass it just simply by um, by legislative, by, by legislature. So Jed refused to give up, and he took things into his own hands. 
and created a campaign in order to get approval voting on the ballot out in Fargo, North Dakota, and built a community to make sure that people got that effort out, educated people on what approval voting was, and ultimately took to the election. It was an incredible process to watch, seeing how many people understood what approval voting was, the impact that it would have, and that ultimately voted for it, and it won with 63% of the vote. And if you've ever done a campaign, if you've ever been involved with politics, 63% is an insanely high bar to pass. Most people vote no on things by default or don't participate. 63% means people understood what it was and were excited for it to happen. So Fargo happened in 2018. The Center for Election Science is supporting a local campaign out in St. Louis, Missouri right now for the 2020 ballot. We've already got, I don't know how many, no, how many ballots, um, signatures we've got collected so far, I've my head, sorry, I should have that. Um, but we're gonna be on the ballot in 2020, and it's more than likely that it'll pass. That'll mean 300,000 more people under approval voting. We aim to build a base of more cities and ultimately go at the state level very soon. So, how can you help? I'll have questions at the end. Um, tell others about approval voting. Sign up to volunteer. Invest in our campaigns. We are especially looking for more places to run approval voting campaign, uh, campaigns to put into an act of approval voting. It's for your local chapter. Us interacting with representatives is also a great step towards that. So much positive for helping organize this. Questions? Okay. Well, I approve of voting instead of ranked choice voting. <laughs> no, I knew it was going to be the next question. Um, and so, uh, so IRB is good. It is better than the system we have right now. But IRB has a bunch of difficulties that make it less optimal than approval voting. And the nice thing is, if you have uh, first past the post right now, you have to choose one. Switching to approval voting involves absolutely no cost beyond the policy change. That's the biggest advantage that it has. With instant runoff voting, more likely than not, you'll have to replace your systems with something expensive. Uh, in fact, in um, uh, Wisconsin right now, there's a, a, a sorry. Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Not Minneapolis, Michigan. Uh, in Michigan, there's a. Um, uh, a big fight that's going on because the, the council won't support the funding necessary to replace the voting machine despite the fact that IRB was enacted. Um, there's also, uh, okay, there you go, so that's the that slide. There's also a difficulty where um, IRB has had failed elections, where people generally agreed the winner was not the person who was meant to have won, where in election science, I won't go too monkey on this, in voting science, we have a concept of a color state winner. It's a winner who would beat everyone else head to head, right? So um, let's say you know Elizabeth Warren went head to head with Bernie Sanders, then with Trump, then with Biden. If she won every time, she would be the color state winner. In Burlington, uh, Vermont, there was a color state winner, which was Andy Montreal, but he lost. Um, in in retro's voting to a progressive Bob Kiss because. People, the way that people ranked their ballots made it so that um, their, the, the trade-offs involved ended up stirring the election towards oh, yes. And unfortunately after this, Burlington, Vermont repealed their uh, instant runoff voting, so they took it away. And in uh, Cary, North Carolina, Pierce County, Washington, Aspen, Colorado, and Ann Arbor, Michigan, they've all repealed ranked choice voting after things like this have occurred. There's also something to be said for the actual complexity of IRB. This is the most recent San Francisco results. Um, you might have to spend a long time looking at this. Um, the amount of time that it took for them to compile those ballots, uh, I think it lasts around a month of nail biting results where we thought Mark Leno was going to win, but ended up being Lyndon Bree in round nine with a ton of exhausted ballots as well as under votes, which is votes that effectively didn't count towards the system because they didn't end up ranking enough choices for it to end up going towards one of the candidates who won. So cost, complexity, 
and it doesn't always lend to the results that you want because ultimately it's very hard to sum preferences. It feels very good as a voter to say, this is my number one, my number two, number three. And with approval voting, you can, you can say that, and say this is my number one, my number two, number three. You just approve of all of them and draw the line somewhere and say, okay, these people don't count. But the problem is when you sum preferences, then it gets really weird. Because if I prefer, if I prefer A to B, you prefer B to C, you prefer C to A, we end up in a loop. And how do you resolve that? That's where complexity is introduced into the system. I could go on, I think I've already gone on too much, but um, uh, you can compare a lot of voting systems against each other, and ultimately, express expressivity and then satisfaction is really what you need to, to evaluate. The Center for Election Science has chosen to support approval voting because it's the simplest, easiest to implement method that works right now. It may not be the best method, there's always score voting, but it's certainly a lot better than what we have. We don't advocate for removing IRB. IRB is great, totally works, it's fine, it's not the best. Any other questions? Uh, go ahead. So, a similar question, but I know on ranked choice voting, of course, sometimes confused by how it works a little bit. I wonder. At least on that, you know, we've got one vote here. I think we just want to vote by vote for four people, by four votes, by vote for seven, seven votes. Run into that kind of. Can you repeat the question? Like, feedback on user understanding. Uh, so, you asked a question um, that I'll summarize in a bit of a different way. Um, there was, people have a question about if you use an approval voting ballot, because you can vote multiple times, does that mean you might get more votes than other people? And, uh, some people have said that it violates the one person, one vote. Uh, it doesn't really apply because you still get one ballot. You still can only vote for a candidate once. You can't give more weighting to one candidate than uh, another candidate. And you can't do it in a way that means that my vote means more than someone else's vote. Um, the other way to look at it is, um, you know, like the game that we just played, People are very used to saying, what are you okay with, or select all that apply. Um, it's a normal thing on surveys, if you ever, you know, on, online, you have check boxes or, or, or radio buttons where you, know, you can only choose one. Um, we've shown that people have had a lot of an easier time and fewer, um, uh, fewer spoiled ballots using approval voting than using a score. So the winner for approval voting is the person with the most votes. The most votes wins. What about an incentive to vote or compulsory vote? Have your position on that? I come from a place which has compulsory vote. You're penalized if you don't vote. So that's outside the scope of what we advocate for with the Center for Election Science. And so we don't have an official, an official policy on, our, on, on compulsory voting. Or paying people to vote. Uh, or paying people to vote. The Center for Election Science doesn't have a policy. I'll have my own policy. I can say what I believe, though. Um, I believe if you have the system right now, then being, like paying people to vote won't make anything better. It'll might even make things worse because you'll have people throwing out crazy votes. But if you treat it like a survey, compelling some people either for a fine or for a benefit, or for a benefit, I think is ultimately a good thing if you have a system that allows people to vote honestly, or you know if you can send in your ballot blank, great. You know the, the census is is an example of this, where you can choose to participate in the census by saying I'm not telling you anything, right? Just say you know here's some basic information, but no thank you. If you do an approval voting ballot and you say you inherently don't want to approve in the process and it's compulsory, just send in an empty ballot. No problem there. And it shouldn't distort too much either. Have you guys uh, looked at a voting holiday? Say again? Did you guys look at a voting holiday? A voting holiday? We definitely support voting holidays. Um, we So the Center for Election Science is again about voting methods as opposed to voting it's also that's voting policy, but we unambiguously would endorse a voting holiday. I can't believe that anyone would be against it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Whiskey, Ohio, just announced today that they're going to make um, Election Day a pay holiday, and they're moving Columbus Day to replace it. Interesting. Oh, Ohio? Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, um, you mentioned it earlier but you have on one of the slides that um, uh, you, know, you had the two little pillars on the left and the right. Oh, yeah. Um, have, have you guys done studies to determine that it, that moderates would benefit from uh, approval voting? And if so, uh, what were the results? And how come it's not just, um, I don't know, people picking the more extreme, the more extreme version, the more extreme candidates? We, we absolutely have done those studies, um, and we have papers, if you want afterwards, I can give you some resources for it. But um, uh, it, it not only works experimentally and, and study-wise, but if you, do, if you do repeated games with people, they'll end up realizing that there's a strategy to the game. And people are very good at that kind of pattern recognition. Um, and so you can, you don't even need to study elections and do hypothetical elections. You can just get a bunch of people in the room, run the same election over and over again, and people will be like, hang on a second, I didn't like that result. And they'll, they'll end up behaving strategically eventually because they want to make sure that they have influence. Go ahead. Um, curious a bit about, uh, about like your theory of change. Like, I mean, inherently in like systems, you know, those who benefit from an existing system, like sit at the top and, and, and have like access to power, control, and, and they just want to, you know, just maintain the system because it serves them. Yeah. Um, and there's always will be like very strong, it will be like, they're highly disincentivized to, to change the system because then they might not get reelected the, under the new system. Yeah, absolutely. How do so. you, like, like, what do you think are like the pillars to actually counteract that dynamic? So the Center for Election Science primarily advocates for ballot initiatives in order to be able to enact approval voting. That said, we've had incredible success just reaching out to commissioners um, and, and, and representatives telling about the system because they get it. They understand that they're playing a game that is just kind of weird or have to do actions that don't really make a lot of sense um, or don't, they have to run in a fashion and run negative campaigns where they don't really like it. So um, we definitely, in our outreach with politicians, it's very rare that we'll find someone who is against it on the on, on principle. Most of the time they're against it because it's something new and maybe it's not their place to change the election laws. It's always very, it's always very scary for a representative to advocate for changing the game by which they get elected because it worked for them in the past. And so that's one of the reasons we primarily go with the, um, the, the, the ballot initiative route. Um, but we're very excited to see you know, how much momentum can, can build and have people change it for themselves. There are plenty of people who you know, would do better off in a situation, in, in, a, um, uh, in an approval voting ballot. So for example, the Democratic Party, there's no one who really gains for their primaries to use single choice voting, right? It's worse for the Democratic Party because it means that their candidate who comes out of that process is more polarizing to the general community. And so the Democratic Party would run a better candidate if they used approval voting. That makes sense. So ultimately, in, in, in all of your own, as it, as a way to kind of cap this off, and I'll take some questions afterwards, um, a better way to think about this is think about how you vote in your daily life. If you're part of an HOA, if you're part of a school board, are you in a situation where you can only choose one, where more would be a better situation, where you, know, you don't have mutually exclusive options, or where should more be a survey rather than a forced decision? If you find that process, if you find that pattern, get involved, advocate for it to change, reach out to me, reach out to the Center for Election Science, and we'll help you. Because every single win, every single time that we improve how an election happens, it gets better, and the system gets better. Thank you. Oh, and I'll leave that. <laughs> Do you want to close this out? Or?
sorry? Do you want to close this out? I don't know what we're doing yeah, next. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for thank you. That was a great presentation. It's really good to learn new processes and ways that we can